Well, thank you uh, very much, Sarah Jessica, for, for coming here today. Oh, thank uh, you for having me. All, all, all of us are uh, Twitter, and uh, <laughs> including those of us who should know better, but uh, we're, we're all excited. Thank but uh, I wanted to begin, before we get into uh, what you're doing both in uh, business entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, is you've been on the stage professionally since the age of 11. Mm -hmm. Then you did Annie, huge hit. <laughs> How did you make the successful transition from childhood to adulthood and not go off the rails as so <laughs> often happens when you have people who succeed at such a young age? How did you do it? Um, I, I think that I had parents who were concerned about a bigger picture about my general well-being and not they were less focused on success any success I may or may not have as a child actor I think they were very cognizant of um, of the transition that can be very difficult between you know cute young child actor to teenager to adulthood and that there had been many landmines um, that we had watched um, be detrimental in careers and you know I'm one of eight kids and I still had to load the dishwasher I still had to put my sisters and brothers to bed I still had to clean up after breakfast I still you know I was required to be a child and a sibling and a daughter and I think though I felt my parents sometimes were overly punitive I'm enormously grateful now because I think it's what allowed me to navigate those tricky waters. And, um, and I think it also actually allowed me to have a career because they were much more focused on the quality of the work that I would choose to do as an actor versus the money opportunities or the larger exposure of television and film. They really wanted me mostly to work in the theater because they felt the promise was better that I might turn out okay. <laughs> you, you had uh, siblings who had been on the stage. Mm -hmm. Did that help as well, that uh, you weren't just the only one there pinning their hopes on or whatever the cliche you Yes, I, no, I, I think all of my, I feel like my back is to some of you, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to upstage you, so I'm gonna move carefully this way. Um, Nothing personal. And still, no, and you smell wonderful. Um, no, no, I, I, um, no, I think you're right, but you're, 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 as I've just discovered, Mr. Forbes is a father of five daughters, which I didn't, I mean, that's crazy. And um, I'm a mother of two daughters, and I find it, like, I'm, ter I'm already terrified of them, um, and they're six, so, so, but you know how important it is to discover in each child um, things they do and, and, and the people they are that make them unique and special. And I think despite the lack of time in my mother's life because of eight of us, she still, I think, found a way to um, recognize that we were all different and she wanted us all to be curious people, but there was no one child more important than the other. And even if that meant my, I was demanding more time because of child labor laws and things like that that required her to be with me, she was pretty good at making certain that I knew that I was no more special than any other sibling. And my brother was a working actor as well. And um, I think we thought of it more as, um, does the phrase journeyman mean anything to anybody in this room, what a journeyman is? I think we, I think, the work was important in our home. And so I think it was, look, I think my mother did an amazing job because, not because I turned out well, but simply because she survived. <laughs> and, um, and because I think she, she cared about the things that I, I realize now as a parent are the things that I feel are worth caring about. And uh, that sounds like it was superb preparation when you ascended your, what you might call the Mount Rushmore of, of, of success in entertainment, oh. that how did you keep yourself grounded? I mean, you, I know you make it a point. You take the kids to school. You do the laundry. You do the shopping. <laughs> so you don't get in a bubble where it becomes isolated and self-destructive. How, 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 do how did you get through that? Well, I think I spent, um, I mean, probably like a lot of you in this room and 
certainly you, there is this period, this gift of years and years of hard work that go into, that go in, that's the success that one may or may not see, the one you're speaking of, for instance. There was so much that led up to that time and so many years spent just working hard. I mean, there were only pay phones then, there were not cell phones, there was not voicemail, there was telephone booths every now and then, and I was like you, like so many people. The gift of wanting something and working hard for it so that by the time you achieve what someone else calls success, you already feel that you are successful in the daily exercise of the pursuit of work. So you so, have the discipline. So I, so I feel like I had, you know, I did this show, say for instance, and people watched it and, um, <laughs> but, but it was always about the work. I didn't think that, I recognized that other people saw it as more successful than other things I'd done, but I didn't see it that way. I felt like it was this, this crazy, heirloom that someone handed off to me and I got to take care of it. And but in a sense it was a continuum of what you'd always been doing. And then I thought now it's time to not do that now and go back to this, the search which I know many of you women disagreed with at the time. Um, <laughs> but because I like, I like the pursuit very much. It's not that I like the hunt more than the kill but I really like the hunt because I think it makes me smarter and more informed and I deal with disappointment better and I have better coping mechanisms and I learn how to have conversations and I meet new people. Before we get to the entrepreneurship, one thing that uh, people who achieve success have to navigate, especially somebody in the line like you've been, challenge of kids. Mm -hmm. You know how to, you judge how to cope, how to defend yourself, what to hit, what not to hit. But how do you uh, get the kids through this where they're sort of not more passive, but they don't have the kind of control that you have? Do you mean the, my children your or children. others? Your, 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 <laughs> your children. Um, <laughs> I didn't know about the other kids. But, uh, <laughs> um, so how do I, meaning how do I, um, what, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, you, sure. you, you have a son, you have uh, the, the twin daughters. They go to school, mm -hmm. they obviously hear a lot about you, the paparazzi, especially mm -hmm. these days where they seem to trample more than ever before. How do you protect them or give them the guidance that your parents gave that this doesn't overwhelm them or they feel right. that it's an intrusion or somehow not good for them? Right, well, uh, so it's a little complicated because um, they, so my children have everything they need Right? So these kinds of problems are much easier problems than most parents have to consider when raising children. So first of all, I don't complain about these particular burdens because there are mothers out there with real concerns who are working three jobs, who have no support, no childcare, bad schools, no familial community. No. So having said that, you know, they're conversations. We talk about our work. We talk about what it means to be, maybe be considered a public person. And um, we talk about the media and social media. And it's, um, you know, how we try not to um, vilify the whole experience so that they don't become uh, we want them to leave the house. We choose to live in a city where we walk out the door. We don't have gates and bodyguards and things and car services. So you want them to walk out of the house. So how we talk to them about this particular intrusion, we describe it with not a lot of emotion, but we're honest about it. And we want them to be graceful, generous, gracious people. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation because their own reactions to it change as they get older. Younger, they say, Mama, why is that? Why are those men taking pictures? And at first I say, oh, well, your dress must be very pretty, Loretta. You must have such a pretty dress on today. And then you can't say that because maybe they don't wear dresses anymore, for instance, say. 
And um, then I'll say, well, there's a lot of really beautiful buildings around here, and the light is so pretty. And then there comes a point in time where that is not, you know, they want candid information. So the conversation keeps changing, but we try to be honest about it and not make it terrible, but also we don't court it. So it's, I think it's, we just talk to them about the way we try to have conversations with them about everything that is scary, funny, awful, good, bad. Sounds like a uh, reference to what you said earlier, that uh, when you achieve the big success, it didn't seem to impinge on your sense of creative fulfillment, that you had done enough before that you could put this in context, not in the reaction, but in terms of the performance itself. No, I think, um, strangely for me, I think any success I have makes me greedier. Like, I want more experiences, and I, I feel the more dishes I get to taste, the more I get to be part of a conversation, the more I get to collaborate, the more I learn, the more informed I am, the more I want to try. I am an insatiable, curious person. I, I, success has just allowed me to try things. It's given me the freedom to make choices and, um, and throw myself at things I don't know and try to surround myself with really smart people. And it's really, honestly, what I wish for everybody who wants to work. And it's the thing that I think most of when I really think about being a working mother is how much I wish other mothers had this sense of choice in their life and that they could choose to be engaged in work the way I get to. And um, it's the thing I feel most excited about in my work, but it's the thing I also feel I wish, I wish other mothers could have that, because not a lot of mothers get to choose their work. A lot of mothers have to work. And um, boy, what a difference, you know? So when do you seem to describe what you said, the entrepreneur, hungry, want to do more, want to go out of the safety zone. <laughs> when did you realize that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? You succeeded in the acting, but you were hungering to do the entrepreneurship. When did you realize it? And when did you say, it's time to do it, time to have those sleepless nights, time to plunge <laughs> in? Um, I think the first time somebody gave me an opportunity to work in business was when I, um, I did a, a, my first fragrance, which was over 10 years ago, with Cody. And um, outside of producing Sex and the City, which I took seriously and I learned a lot about, obviously, about the business of producing and television and all those numbers that you need to know and those relationships that need to be taken care of, I was more familiar with that language when I stepped out and I became involved in the world of fragrance, for instance, which had a whole new set of rules, which is a ridiculously competitive business. Um, I think I discovered really much to my surprise that, um, that I connected to business, that I connected to margins and profits and those big, what used to seem very complicated conversations to me, all sort of were illuminated and I loved them. I loved being responsible to and for companies. I loved working hard to be deserving of the time and the money that was put into launching a fragrance. Many of you in the room know what it takes to launch a fragrance, the marketing, and all of the machinery that goes into those first you know, 10,000, 5,000 bottles. I had no idea that I would respond to business that way. And I just happened to be working with really smart people, particularly one smart person named Catherine Walsh, who was really running my brand. And it was like, I describe it as a whole other life opened up. A whole other career was kind of presented to me if I was willing to work hard enough to have it. And I, it was very hard for me to not be that involved like to remove myself after that would have been, it's very, it's very different from, you know, I like being a hired hand sometimes in my work as an actor. Sometimes I really like producing. But in terms of business, I 
don't have the constitution to just let somebody else do it. And then I look at it, give, give me a short list, it's okay. No, I have to be there deconstructing it, splitting the atom, because I just love it. Well, describe how uh, your line of shoes, you just didn't wait for it to happen. You made a phone call and plunged <laughs> right into it. Yeah, well, I had, um, you know, because of that show, I, um, <laughs> and because of her and that part, and she had that, you know, fevered relationship with um, shoes. And I, I love shoes, too. Uh, it's m not as all-consuming, but, um, but I kept having these opportunities to produce a shoe line, and I kept saying no much to the chagrin of people in my life. And um, finally, these two very smart businesswomen that I spent time with said to me, what is stopping you? What's the problem? And I, kept, and I said, it's the partner. I know the kind of partner I want. I know the kind of shoes I want to produce. And I think there's one man that can do it. And they said, what is stopping you from calling George Malcolmus III, uh, who is the CEO of Manolo Blahnik? And I was like, well, he's kind of spoken for. And um, they said, call him. What, I mean, what do you have to lose? And, which I don't know why I didn't think that way, but so I called him and he said, be at my office tomorrow morning. And um, we sat there and we discovered, I'd known George since 1986, before, before um, Sex and the City actually. And um, we discovered we had arrived in New York at the same time, we had the same points of reference um, in the world, in the shoe category, that there were certain designers that had made such an impression on us when we had first arrived in New York in the late 70s. Um, and that there was a space that we were really interested in pursuing. Um, and if we could hit that mark and find a retailer who wanted to help us tell our story, that it was worth the investment and the worth, worth the risk. Because it was about making a beautiful handmade shoe in Italy, as Italy does, like nobody else, versus a very inexpensive, not well-made shoe that I would have been rich um, producing. But, <laughs> I wanted to make the shoe that I could offer up in all good conscience and I would be excited about, that I would want to wear, and that was the only way I could honor this relationship with these women, these women, these 10 million women who had given me the opportunity. Does that make sense? Yes. And, uh, and I found George, and there he was, and he said yes. And uh, that's how you chose the price points? So, yes. Yeah, so, there happened to be at this moment this space in the category that nobody was really messing with yet. There weren't a lot of competitors in that category, which is, you know, 295, which is not affordable and not accessible for everybody I know. But to offer a shoe handmade in Italy at some of the factories that are making all the other shoes that are $1,200 a pair, um, we, 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 we found this magnificent man in Italy, Ricardo, who's a fourth generation shoemaker. We could do it, the numbers were right. Nordstrom, who was this, our retail partner in the beginning, was very excited about this idea, and we just had to make it work. We had to tell our story, I knew I wanted it. There were three important pillars. I knew from the beginning that I really wanted to um, live up to, that were our brand mission. And, um, and that they would be well made and we'd have a retailer who supported this and we were able to do that. And from then it's, it's grown and um, it's had some great success, it's, uh, it's had disappointments and um, all of it has been good for us to learn from. Entrepreneurs, as you know, have successes but they also have setbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you learn from the setbacks, like Halston and others. When, mm. when, when do you feel, okay, it's time to realize this is not working, yeah. cut your losses, move on? <laughs> and what, what did you learn from those? Uh, oh, it's, such a, it's so good because... Um, Bitten was another. You, you yeah. Know, when you take I'm risks, a, you're not going to always hit a home run. Yeah, and I, I don't, you know, there's nothing. No, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I am... Risk doesn't scare me. I think what I've learned from those experiences, from working with you know at Halston and um, and and Bitten, one, in the case of Halston, is that um, I describe it like when you're single and you meet this, this fellow, say for instance, and everybody says, oh, he's got warning signs all over him, and you're like, 
no, 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 no. <laughs> I can fix him. <laughs> and, you know, Halston had a history of trouble. It had had an uneven renaissance, like over and over again, been reinvented. And I thought, first of all, who would have ever thought that this girl from Ohio would, someone would say, do you want to run Halston? Do you want to be creative director of Halston? So how could I say no to that opportunity, even if it was a total mess, which it was? Um, <laughs> But I'm a bitter ender. This is my fatal flaw. I am a bitter ender. And I will stay, I will cross the finish line bloodied until I, I recognize that there is nothing left to be done. And there came a point in the Halston, my tenure there, it's just accentuating to some punctuation mark for me, <laughs> that, that the work there that the, that the philosophy was no longer something that I could, that, that that philosophy that was being adopted was not a place that I, I couldn't, uh, I didn't agree with it. Philosophically, I was, a, a, I, we were in disagreement. And so I would not have been good there. But I left with one really, really great friend who's become really important in my life, who I've learned an enormous amount from. And that you walk away from that experience having learned, you know, I learned about tech packages and overseas factories and how to communicate with factories in China and how to hire people and promote from within and, you know, complicated people and how do you navigate strong personalities and um, how can you not learn from that? And the thing with Bitten was just bad timing in the market. You know, people that had a great idea that would have worked three years later, big. But you know, that's just unfortunate, but I love those people. I learned so much from them. I love the idea behind the brand. Um, so I'm better in my head for having had those disappointments. Do you think as an entrepreneur, are there different rules still for women? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, I think it's, my colleague and I, we just had this experience and it was so kind of, uh, it was kind of a cliche, but the thing is, I don't think when those, when those kind of, um, when people reveal themselves to be sort of stuck in a time and a place, I try to think of what is informing the way they're choosing to speak to me or a female colleague. And I really, really try to think about where they're from, who's been influential in their life, who's been in their ear talking to women, about women, for women. Because I'm not like crazy, you know, you have to, we're women. Because I feel like just showing up and doing our job well says enough. But we just had this experience and I said, you know, I think this is a really a, 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 a cultural issue. I think for this particular person, it was almost a generational issue. And I think it, this, I could see this person struggling to live up to a new idea. But you have to be willing to, 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 to take them there and, 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 and kind of show them the way without, without um, scolding them. It, it, that doesn't do any good. You have to sort of massage them into the present. <laughs> Do you know? Do you like guys that know what phrase. I mean? Like, you have to show them the way. You don't have to tell them. Does that make sense? Yeah. It doesn't so. mean that it's not enormously frustrating and you feel diminished and you feel that you're being someone's, but what are you gonna do? Give up on that person? You gotta work with them. You, they bring in something too that you need. They have skills that I don't have, or a factory, for instance. <laughs> um, so, and I'm not talking about Ricardo in Italy. Not at all. So here you're an, an actor. You've got a show coming up on HBO, a series, Divorce, uh, in mm -hmm. the fall. Mother, entrepreneur. Another area that you're having an impact is a social activist, a thought leader. You, among other things, you've been a UNICEF ambassador for almost 20 years. You're on the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanity. You're very active in ballet, the New York City Ballet. You have vice chairman. You've been involved in the New York Public Schools. How do you identify issues which you wish to champion, and how do you use your voice to give them something, a special push? 
Well, I, it's, it, it's hard. Um, once again, I look at all of you because I feel like we're all trying, we all want to be involved in our communities and we tend to respond to things that are familiar to us in some way. And the hardest part is saying no. Um, but I feel that if you take on too much, you sort of dilute your efforts. And so mine often seemed to come back to education and arts and education because it was a, such, such a huge part of my upbringing. And not having money growing up and the arts being this outlet for us was such an enormous, important influence. And I think it was, it was the gateway for a lot of, it was for me, for my siblings. And the idea of um, not having arts in our lives, not having good arts programs in public, school, in public schools, especially because we know what the data reveals now about arts education, um, what it, how it changes the life of a child's, uh, their academic career. Um, I just feel like we're all better, we're all more complete people the more we're exposed to the arts. And cultural institutions suffer because they have to raise dollars. And really what they should be doing is just focusing on creating art, whether it's dance or, or a museum, visual arts, um, the theater. Uh, and so I try to put my efforts toward areas that I feel strongly about, that I, that I feel are important, where I think I can contribute. And you know, I, when I first joined the board of the New York City Ballet, I was terrified of that because I looked at the board and it was all like CEOs of, you know, big corporations, and I didn't have those friendships, and I couldn't call upon rich friends. I don't have rich friends. I, I don't know how I was going to raise money, and um, but I had to think of other ways to contribute. You know, so I started thinking about, well, what is the next generation? Who are the next people who are going to support ballet? Who are the theater goers who aren't 50, 60 years old? So how do you cultivate a new generation um, that will walk up to Lincoln Center and purchase two tickets, three tickets, four, or subscriptions? So I thought, well, that's something I do. So I try to think about ways I can contribute and do it being informed. And if I'm not informed, I tend to say no, because I think you can hurt something. Even if you care about it, if you're not informed, which takes time, then I think you end up hurting something. So that's how I try to make my choices. As we conclude, uh, you talked earlier about you're in a position where you could do things that you want to pursue. A lot of mothers, single mothers, don't have that. What are the issues that you feel need to be addressed in this election that haven't been or must be, whether it's child care, paid leave, equal, what? What, what's driving you on? You just said it. Um, I think certain candidates are talking about some of the things that are, I mean, I, I, met, I met with this uh, young woman right before we got together today. She was asking me the same questions about this election cycle and what was important. And I, I realized that every answer I had and I said to her is all comes back to mothers. And, and um, so there is a, look, it's, it's, it's the minimum wage. It's, universal pre-k because we know that when mothers have a safe place for their children to go when they're get when children are getting education early in life we see the difference that can make so that comes back to a mother and purse strings and the opportunities she have um, immigration to be honest i think has a lot to do with mothers in this country whether they're documented or they're ch i mean all the ways that people get here in this country and i think the things that i I care about whether it's you know health care and, and and how do we make that system work and and if there are numbers that a lot of people object to, is there a way to sort it out that we can all once and for all be sure that the people in this country, especially mothers, have health care for themselves, for their children. The healthier the mother are the mother is, it's more likely that she can be in a position to take care of her children. If she can take care of herself I mean, we, we know all these things. So uh, for me, it's kind of the basics. It's, um, it's minimum wage, it's health care, it's education, it's universal pre-K, it's um, uh, immigration. Um, those feel to me that are the issues that hit homes of people that are on the margins and most deserve advocacy. Um, but I feel that there's been a lot of really 
substantive conversation more on one side than the other. Um, but it's a general election now, and I think we're going to, you know, I think all candidates are going to be forced to have these conversations. And, and I think it's going to be really good for us. And the more we have discourse that's educational and civilized, the better we are. And the more we listen to people that we don't agree with, even if they really bother us, <laughs> the better we are. And so I am going to try to be my best self from now until November. <laughs> and. Um, you know, support the candidate that I, I think best addresses these issues that are important to me and women in this country and, um, and, and, and be ever more hopeful for um, civilized and stimulating discourse. <laughs> Underline. <laughs> In, in, in Do you agree? Are you excited about that? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> father of five daughters. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, ser seriously, uh, the the question becomes: uh, you you underscored it is, how do you create the opportunity for people to have the opportunity? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what this country is the basis, land of opportunity. How do you make it happen? Uh, in closing, you made a statement that uh, certainly hit me. You said, "I envy." the 12-year-old I was who marched out and sang Annie. <laughs> I couldn't be that girl now. I know too much. So perhaps you couldn't talk to yourself as a 12-year-old, but what would you say today to yourself 30 years ago? What advice would you go back and say, here, here, here's something you should know? I wouldn't change any of it. I wouldn't give myself advice because every agonizing, painful thing every teeny little triumph, every small victory, every time a check bounced, every time I had to do a job I didn't want to do, um, I secretly loved it. I loved, I loved being upset. I loved when my heart was broken. Oh my God, I love the agony of heartbreak. <laughs> I like pushing on the bruise a little bit. Um, because I just think it's good for us. So I wouldn't change any of it. <laughs> I, think, I think what you've, uh, what, what you've said here, <laughs> what you've said here underscores what you once said. You said, I'm not a feminist, I'm a humanist. <laughs> and uh, I think you've given that real meaning today. And before you go, um, you uh, like Wilkie Collins, as we do in our family. Yes. Wilkie Collins was a writer, English, who wrote the first detective novel, yeah. modern detective novel in the English language. So as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to give you the first edition of uh, Moonstone. Oh, my God. Which, uh, which amazingly, oh even though he is an Englishman and uh, the British and the American would publish, this book, his famous feels, one, oh was, uh, was uh, published actually first in the United States and then in England. So the no American way. first edition is the genuine first edition. My, my son is named James Wilkie for Wilkie Collins because it was my husband's father who passed away before I met him. That was his favorite writer. So my son is named for my, my husband's father and Wilkie for Wilkie Collins. And that book, The Moonstone, and The Moonstone is my favorite because of that. So thank you. Thank oh my you. God. Thank you didn't have to do that. What a, oh, that's so lovely. Thank you.